you will, be turning in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. To the book of Genesis. We're going... We're going to be uh, focusing on a gentleman by the name of Joseph. Uh, you've heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. Jacob was the one he changed his name to Israel. Israel was, that's something I did not know for the longest time, that all of these nations and all of these uh, tribes, if you will, Judah, y'all have heard of Judah? These were all men's names. They were the son of Jacob or the son of Israel. Israel's name uh, was changed to Israel from Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons in which one of them was uh, named Joseph. He was the youngest. And I want to look at him today and just to get started, many times when, and as we bring this message to you this morning, I want you to keep in mind that Joseph was a type of Christ in the Bible. And what I mean by type of Christ, uh, we went through a kind of a, a, a class called the typologies in the Bible. It's where you take a story or an example from one place and you can apply it, the characteristics of something else. And Joseph was a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And you can find that throughout the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Jesus did not just come on the scene as a baby in a manger in the, in, in the New Testament, Matthew. He's been throughout the Scriptures. God has been foretelling of His Son and been foretelling of a Savior from day one. Matter of fact, whenever Adam and Eve fell in the garden, what did they clothe themselves with? Fig leaves, which is a type of man's religion. Man tries to cover their own sin by, by if I can work hard enough, or if I can do this good enough, or if I can please God, maybe He'll overlook our sin. But as the Bible says that our sin is as filthy rags, we fall short of the glory of God. And so what did God do? God was not happy with the fig leaves. So what did God do? There had to be a sacrifice. And from day one, there has been bloodshed and sacrifice given to cover sin. God said, the fig leaves, your religion is not good enough. I must cover you in my righteousness. And so the, the aprons of animal skin, you will find, is a type of Christ. How He's the one that took care of our sin. You go on, Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is a type of Christ. Those that were found on the ark when judgment came, they were safe. They were safe, and judgment did not harm those. When and I remember hearing a preacher say this; it's always stuck with me. When judgment fell, the ark rose above the judgment. The ram in the bush. When Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him, and right before he was getting ready to sacrifice him, God said, "Stop." And there was a ram in the bush that took Isaac's place, a type of Christ. And etc. It goes on. The sacrificial lamb when it comes to the tabernacle. You can, you, can, you can go through the law of God and how the sacrifices, you take a spotless lamb. It, it took the blood of a spotless lamb to, uh, to satisfy that sin for a year. It was, it was a types of Christ throughout the Scripture. Well, Joseph is one of those types of Christ. And you can apply this in many different ways. You can look at it in uh, a personal relationship, a personal walk with God. You can look at it as Israel. You can look at it as uh, God's people. And you can apply this. That's what's so wonderful about the Word of God. You can apply it in many different ways. But I want to look at the story of Joseph for a few minutes. And I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 45. I'm basically going to give you my final point. And then we're going to go back and lead up to that final point. I want to go ahead and, and plant this point in your mind. <clears throat> Look in verse number 5 of Genesis 45. Genesis 45 beginning in verse number 5. 
This is Joseph talking to his brothers. Okay? And we're going to read up to this. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now, it was not you. I got that highlighted in my Bible here. It was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now I want to look at Joseph's life, and his brothers, and in the situation that brought them to the place where Joseph said this to his brothers. Now I want you to notice that it says, It is not you that sent me here. But it was God that done it. And many times I like to go back to verses of Scripture like this and the sovereignty of God verses because I'll be honest with you, sometimes I get a bad case of the pooch mouth. I forget who God is. And I remember there were times in my life that I thought my life was over, son. I had done made some decisions in my life. Hindsight 2020, they were bad decisions. There was times I made decisions that I thought I was making the best decision that I possibly could and it didn't turn out the way I thought it should. It left me empty. It left me in trouble sometimes. I was known to get in trouble a little bit growing up. Anybody else like that around here? Just me, I know. But sometimes God has to remind me and you of who He is because God wants us walking by His side. God wants us trusting in Him and not ourselves. And I want you to notice a few things. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start there. Genesis 37. Begin reading with me in verse 3. We're going to lead up, we're going to look at some events that took place between verse chapter 37 and chapter 45. Verse 3 of chapter 37 reads this, Now Israel loved Joseph, Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Many of y'all have heard of Joseph and the coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Joseph's brothers were jealous over him because of the favor that he was found in the eyes of his father. Joseph got favored more than the other boys. And his other brothers kind of got jealous and the scriptures use the terminology, they hated him. And a couple more reasons, and it, 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 was, it was added on to it, not only because Father Jacob paid him more attention or favored him more, but listen to what chapter, uh, verse 5 says. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made ob... How you say that word? Huh? Help me, school teacher. Obes ob obesance to my sheaf. That, mean, that means to bow down. But I, do, I know I'm just not pronouncing it correctly. And, uh, and made obeisance to my sheaf. In verse 8, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed rule reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. 
And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, that thou hast what is this uh, said unto him, What is this dream thou that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brother indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brothers envied him, and his father observed the saying. Now, not only was he being favored by his father, he was also getting these dreams. And remember, dreams meant something to these people back in the day. They were given these dreams, and the dreams were that basically his brethren and his family would one day bow down to Joseph, which was unheard of because the youngest never got that kind of recognition. Back in the day, tradition always gave the eldest the inheritance. They become the patriarch of the family. But I'm loving to read in the Word of God, God always goes against the traditions. He always goes with the younger, just like with Esau and Jacob, he said the younger shall serve the older. Uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the younger shall serve the older, which was completely opposite of what tradition uh, used to teach. Well, you keep reading, and you'll find where Joseph would basically, and from what I read, his brothers were a little bit of some mischief because he would go and, 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 and spy, or not spy, but he would go and keep check on his brothers, and he would report back to their dad. So not only was he being favored by daddy, he was also kind of like the family narc. <laughs> so his... His brothers did not like him. His brothers couldn't stand him. And his brothers were went out to feed the flock one, one evening. And it said that in verse 12, And his brethren went to feed their father's flocks in Shechem. And Israel, Jacob, called Joseph and said, I want you to go and check on your brothers. So he went to check on his brothers. And down in verse number 18, it says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said unto one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. <laughs> they were letting it fester inside. They had not forgot about this dream. I am not going to bow down to Joseph. He is the younger brother. We hate him. I will not bow to Joseph. I know people like that today when you compare it to Jesus. Jesus is a type of Christ. I hate Jesus. They can't stand him. These atheists and the people that don't believe, they'll tell you, I'll never bow down to that. Well, we'll just see about that, won't we? Never say never. And in verse 20 it says, Come now therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. <laughs> and then verse 21 says, And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many, many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead <coughs> with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to, e to Egypt. And Joseph said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Now listen to what's going on. 
they felt really bad about wanting to kill their brother. They said, we can't kill our brother. Listen, boys. He's our brother. He's blood. They were having a moment of conviction there. They said, let's, instead, let's sell him. <laughs> That's a lot better. That way I can sleep at night. I won't be able to sleep if I kill. Let's just, sleep. Let's just sell him. <laughs> well, they conspired to do this, and they decided to do this, and long story short, you can keep reading. What happened was, is while they were waiting, the Midianites, which were merchants, they come by and they found Joseph in that pit. So they got Joseph up out of the pit and took him with him, with them, and sold them to the Ishmaelites. And from what I've been taught, Ishmaelites were almost like gypsies. They traveled, they wandered, they sold, they traded, stuff like that. Yes. That's where they got their name. Well, they ended up, the Midianites came back and saw Joseph in the pit, got him up out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites now have him. Well, his brethren came back to the pit to get Joseph, and behold, where's Joseph? Basically, the Midianites beat him to the punch, is what happened. Well, they get scared, because remember, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other brothers. So now, they got to go back and talk to Daddy. What happened to your brother? Well, what they did was, when you read the story, they took his coat, ripped it up, dipped it in blood, took some animal's blood, dipped it in him, and took it back to Daddy and said, Look, this is all we found of Joseph. Well, Daddy automatically assumed, Oh no, my son's done been killed by a wild beast. And the brethren did not correct him on that. They basically let Daddy believe how it appeared, and they created the scenario. And it appeared that Joseph had been killed. Which all the while, Joseph is in the back of a wagon headed to Egypt. Okay? And you will find all that in Genesis 37. And it ends up in Genesis 37, verse number 36, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt under Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So now, Joseph is in Egypt. In, verse number th in chapter 39, you will read stories, and I'm just going to show you, I just want to show you how it's building up here. Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his, sight, in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So when he got to Egypt, God was prospering Joseph, and Pharaoh saw this, and Potiphar saw this. So he made him overseer of what was going on. Joseph's fame started, really getting, started getting big throughout Egypt. When you keep reading, and you'll find where Potiphar's wife, Kind of, she kind of liked Joseph. And she got him a few times and uh, was seducing Joseph. But Joseph turned her down. Well, like most women, they don't like rejection. So she started lying. I'm sorry. No, this one, Potiphar's wife, did not like the fact that he that she was being rejected, and then one night in the chamber she started screaming, "Oh, help me, help me!" And the king and Pharaoh's people come in, and she accused Joseph of seducing her. So what happens was Potiphar took Joseph 
and had him cast into prison. So here, Joseph is now in prison. Okay? And we're not talking about the high rise. We're talking rat infested, chained to the wall dungeon prison. All right? So he was locked up and imprisoned over lies, which is another type of Christ. How he was convicted of something he did not do. All right? So you, that's what I meant by typology. You can see characteristics that kind of fit together. Well, it come to pass in verse chapter 41 that Pharaoh had a dream. And I want to read this dream. In 41 verse 1, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by a river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine. Now, a kine is a cow, just to let you know. And come up out of the river seven well-favored kine, and fat-fleshed, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and the lean-fleshed cows did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. And so it awoke Pharaoh. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears divide the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And in time purposes, Pharaoh woke up and said, he called all of his magicians and all of his wise men and said, I need to know the interpretation of this dream. This dream has really got me bothered. Well, none of them could do it. And one of his officers said, Sir, I know of a man that might be able to help you out because he helped me whenever I was in prison with him. I had a dream, and you can read the chapter before that, about how Joseph interprets some dreams for some men in the prison. And he said, I know a man that can interpret this dream. So he brings up Joseph, and Joseph tells him what the dream means in verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. And I need you to notice what he says right here. Look in verse 25, chapter 41 in verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Remember, he had two dreams, but he says your dream is one. God hath, God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. That right there, whenever I read that, that told me God's got a plan. God is not making this thing up as he goes. He said, and listen what he says, he's showing Pharaoh these dreams are to show Pharaoh what God is about to do. Verse 32, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. The interpretation of the dream was basically He's saying there's seven years of plenty coming. That stand for the, the fat cows and the, the good cows. It, that stood for the, the good corn on the ear, the ears of corn and the, the real plump corn. He said, but there's also going to come seven years of famish. And the reason that the skinny cows eat up the big cows because he said that the famine is going to be so great that they're going to forget, it's going to be so bad, that they're going to forget about the good seven years. Well, Pharaoh was like, oh my gosh, what should we do? We need to find somebody that can, can help out around here and take charge of this thing, and we need to plan for this famine. So he puts Joseph over everything. And listen to what he says. Look in chapter 41, and look with me, beginning in 41. 40. 39. <laughs> and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. 
Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall it be, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh put Joseph over everything and said, What are we supposed to do? So what Joseph began doing... The seven years of plenty began, and what he started doing, he started gathering up as much as he could and putting it in the storehouse. Okay? And Egypt became, became very plentiful with wheat and corn. Okay? Because Joseph got this dream, told him what God was going to do, he had it planned out, he knew what to do, and so he began stockpiling for the seven bad years. Okay? Okay? Now remember, God's the one that said, I'm about to do this. Alright? God is the one causing the famine. Now so far, there's been no reason for it. God has just said, this is going to happen. I am going to bring a famine. Alright? Well look now in chapter 42. We'll look up in ver chapter 41, the last verse of 41. Verse 57. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was sore in all the lands. Chapter 42. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Now remember, he said ten. He had twelve. One of them they thought was dead, was Joseph. That knocked it down to eleven. Well, Joseph, if you read, he says, You can't send Benjamin, which was the next to the youngest. He said, because I've done lost one son, and he says, and if I send all you boys out and something would happen, then that means I would have no sons to carry on my name. He says, so you got to leave the youngest one with me. So ten of them went to Egypt. Now remember, Pharaoh had put Joseph over all of his, all of Egypt. And y'all know how Egyptians are. Have you seen the garb and everything? I mean, they'd put the array, they'd rate him in gold fine linen, you know he was all decked out, man, because, I mean, Egypt was all about some, some fanciness back in the day. They'd even wear makeup. Well, it says that his brethren came into Egypt to buy, gold, to buy corn and said they come up before Joseph because they had to appear before Joseph, but because he was king and Pharaoh, it was automatically uh, known that you don't come up to Pharaoh like this. You come up to Pharaoh like this, right? Well, his brethren comes in unto him, right? They think they're walking in unto an Egyptian. Well, the Bible says that Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. Number one, they come to him with their heads bowed. Number two, he's in all this garment. He's been, it's been years since they've seen him. They thought he was dead. They didn't recognize Joseph. Okay? But let me say this at this point. These men, when Joseph recognized their brethren, these men were as good as took care of as the day that he actually started taking care of them because he recognized them, but guess what? They didn't recognize Joseph. And that kind of feeds into how some people has been, their salvation has been taken care of, but just because they don't recognize it, doesn't change the situation. Okay? Joseph saw his brethren. And from what I got out of it, Joseph started messing with him. 
He started messing with them. He remembered the dreams that had been dreamed. My brother shall bow down before me. Well, here they are. In Egypt, bowed down before Joseph. Well, Joseph accused them of being spies. And they were like, oh no, 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 we're not spies. And they said, we are just come to buy food for our family. Matter of fact, we've got one brother left at home with my son, with, with our dad. Joseph said, go get your other brother. I'll not sell you any food or nothing until you go get your other brother and bring him back to me. Well, see, Daddy done said, I don't want to send you Benjamin. So they go back. They go back. It's a, it's a long story. You can read it. But they go back. Joseph has, and they brought money to buy food, right? Well, while the boys wasn't looking, Joseph commanded his servants to fill their backpacks up with corn and to put their money back in their backpack. In other words, he didn't charge them for it. Well, his brothers are on the way back, and they find corn. Not only do they find corn in their bags, they find their money. And it scared them because they thought, oh my gosh, he's done accused us of being spies. They're going to they're gonna think we're thieves too. Well, they get back. Long story short, they run out of food. Daddy says, go back to Egypt and buy more food. They said, the man said, don't come back without my brother. Well, they had a big argument back and forth. One of them, Reuben, stood up and said, I will stand for Benjamin. I will replace Benjamin. I'll make sure he comes back to you, Dad. So they go back. <clears throat> Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph sends for his brother uh, Benjamin. In chapter four, and then when you read in chapter 44, they come back with Benjamin. Now remember, they still don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized his brethren. They send him back to get their daddy now. See, he's just messing with them. All right? Well, he does the same thing again, except this time, Joseph has his cup, his silver cup, the king's cup, planted in Benjamin's backpack. And he lets them go out. Well, then he no longer sends them back to their daddy's house and he sends his servants and says, go capture them and look through their bags. Well, they find the cup. Well, oh, these boys are like, oh my God, how is this happening? And you know what? When there's one place that even says that the boys looked at each other and said, God's doing this to us guys because of what we did to Joseph a long time ago. We're answering for this. Y'all do realize God's punishing us. They were scared to death. Because back then, guys, they didn't play with you. They didn't slap you on the wrist and throw you in an air-conditioned, heated hotel room, pretty much, with internet and ping-pong and foosball and everything else. We're talking this stuff required back in the day. They would kill you. They would put you to death for this kind of stuff. Well, they bring them back and they're like, I swear. <laughs> We did not take this stuff. Well, they finally get the whole family to Egypt. Long story short, you can read this. They get the whole family to Egypt. They get over to verse number, chapter 45. Get with me to 45. They've come back and the whole chapter of 44 is basically Reuben pleading with Joseph. Please do not keep Benjamin here because Joseph said I'm not keeping all of you here he says I want the one that had the cup in his bag to stay with me and he will become my servant now think about this the men the brothers thought that Pharaoh was dealing harshly with them they were scared to death Joseph was just wanting to get his family there with him. It seemed one way, but actually what was taking place was something else. You get what I'm saying? Now he was making Benjamin stay with him. Daddy done said, you boys don't come home without Benjamin. <laughs> and now here Joseph was making him, Pharaoh was making him stay with me. 
Well, Reuben starts pleading with Pharaoh, ple or Joseph, please don't do this. Our dad will surely die if we do not come back with this boy. Gets to chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. That's a big statement. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Reminds me of what it was said about Jesus. He came to his own, but his own received him not. Who hung Jesus on the cross? The Jews. His own people. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. Verse 3, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? Listen to this next sentence. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. They were scared too. Not only was this Pharaoh, but now it turns out that this Pharaoh is their brother <laughs> that they throwed in a pit many years ago and left him for dead. They thought, rut row, double whammy. We are done for. Their brothers didn't know what to do. And I noticed what it said right there. They were troubled at his presence. When they found out it was Joseph, they were dumbfounded. They couldn't move. They were scared to death. It reminds me of that verse of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians 1 where it says, And they shall suffer destruction from the presence of the Lord. His presence being on this earth is what is going to cause that trouble, son. Well, these men were the same way. It was because of His presence they were scared to death. But that's where we lead in. But what did He do? If you go back and look, Joseph was blessing these men. Every time he would send them back home, he would fill their bags with corn and money. He was blessing them. He wasn't charging them for the corn. He wasn't charging them for the food. He was just throwing the blessings out on them. But yet they would get somewhere, find the blessings, and they would get scared. And I started thinking about that. Do you know how many Christians today, Jesus has dumped the freedom and the liberty and the grace and the mercy out on you and me, but yet how many people every day they can't live with it. They feel like we got to do something. They cannot enjoy the grace and the mercy and the love that Jesus is just bestowing upon us and we feel guilty. How many of you have ever felt that way? That God has felt that God has forgiven you 100%, but yet sometimes my flesh won't let me believe that. I feel guilty for it. And these men were scared to death over the blessings that Joseph was dumping out on them. Now, remember, they come up to the place in verse 4, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the land in which the, there shall neither, neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Now remember what He told Pharaoh he told Pharaoh, God is showing you what he's about to do. So you know what that means? That means that back whenever Joseph was with his father and they were conspiring to kill him, the sovereign God of heaven already knew about this famine that was coming. He already, because God is the one that done it. So what did God do? God needed them in Egypt. 
Now, who got jealous of Joseph? His brethren. Who conspired to kill him? His brothers. Who threw him in the pit? His brothers. Who ended up getting him and selling him? The Midianites and the Ishmaelites come into play. Right? Who found favor? Whose eyes did he find favor in when he got to Egypt? Pharaoh. All of these things were done by people making choices in their lives over a period of years. But whenever the final outcome got to the end of it, what did he say? It's not you that sent me here. It was God. And I look back into my life even today, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure you can do the same thing. Let me tell you something. Whenever I was sitting in my pool of bad mistakes, I couldn't see it. But hindsight 2020, looking back into my life now, I see the mighty hand and the providential hand of God moving in my life that every single bit of it has brought me to the place where I am now. And guess what? We're not finished. We've still got some journeying to go, praise God. And we find out that even though we're making the decisions in our lives, it's God taking us somewhere. And I want you to notice something. When did the brothers start heading for Joseph? In the famine. See, as long as things were going good, they were still over in their land in Egypt. So, I mean, Joseph's in Egypt. But when trouble came, people say, well, what's the judgment's got to do with it? Hey, it's them times whenever people... It's easy to seek God whenever our bank account's full and everybody's healthy and things are just going our way. But you let trouble come, son. God uses it as a tool. Just like the old saying, we've said it, we've said it time and time again, with no destruction, there is no rebuilding. With no perishing, there is no prospering. It's a contrast. God used the famine to get the boys headed to Egypt. And by the way, just like Joseph was a type of Christ, if you keep reading, you find out that's the way God got Israel into Egypt. And what happened shortly after that? You can start reading at the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, where it says that the children of Israel prospered so much in Egypt that they become so big... That that's when Pharaoh, because see, Pharaoh was a good guy at this time. He was taking care of Israel. He was taking care of Jacob and his brethren. You read the rest of the uh, Genesis, he was taking care of them. But then it says that another king took over Egypt that knew not Joseph. And he saw that Israel was growing so prosperous, he says they become mightier than us. He said, let us deal wisely with them. And that's when they were put in bondage, which caused what to happen after that. God sent another type of Christ, Moses, which was a deliverer, the promised child, to take them out of Egypt. See, everywhere you look, guys, it's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He took them into Egypt so He could take them out of Egypt. And every one of them, in the Joseph story, you can look at it in the way of being brought to Jesus. What it took to get these guys to Jesus. And can I tell you something? That's what God's doing. He's drawing us to Jesus. He's drawing us to Joseph. He's drawing us to the prosperity that, is, that, that, that Christ has for us. And to preserve the way. Though the situations look bad, though it looks gleam, uh, uh, bleak out here, it looks like, oh my gosh, the world is just going to hell in a handbasket. Little can we tell it's because of these events that God is taking us to Joseph. And the decisions that we've made, the decisions they're making, 
It's all working for the good that God is doing. Hey, these boys were scared. They thought their brother was dead. They done thought they done messed up. But come to find out what happened. God had His mighty hand over every bit of it the whole way. And it reminds me that when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, it reminds me of 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. In other words, the scales are going to be wiped away. Turn with me to Isaiah 25. Isaiah chapter number 25. And I'm going to close with this verse of Scripture. Isaiah 25. Read what it says with me. Isaiah 25 verse number 6. The Bible says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of the fat things full of morrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of His people shall, be take, shall He take away from off all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. The Bible says there's coming a day, guys, that the veil, remember how we've talked about how why did Israel not see Jesus? They were blinded. But the Bible prophesies that there's coming a day where God shall take the veil off of all eyes. In other words, He's going to reveal Himself to all men. Most people don't love Jesus because they don't know Jesus. But the Bible speaks, says Joseph revealed himself to his brethren. There's coming a day where that same thing is going to take place with Jesus. The veil shall be wiped away. The veil shall be taken off from off the face of all eyes. I forget who God is sometimes. And I'm thankful today. I've heard people say things like this. Well, God can take your mind. Your, God can take your bad decisions and make good out of it. That's like, that's like saying God just uses what we give Him. Like God, God takes lemons and when we give God lemons, He makes lemonade. No, no, no. God created the lemon. God created the situation. It's not that God takes our bad decisions and works good for them. God ordains these bad decisions to head to the good. That brings peace to my heart. I hear people say, well, what's the use? You know, if God's in control of everything, God's in control of everything brings peace to my heart because can I tell you something? If God was this God just sitting back waiting to see what we going to do, What if he decides not to intervene? I'll mess this thing up. I've seen me do it. But whenever I find out that it's all being ordained and orchestrated by a sovereign providential hand of God, it makes me sit back and say, well, you know what? The situation, just like these brothers, the situation don't look good. But hindsight 2020, I know that whenever I get through this storm, I'm going to see the results of what God has been doing this whole time. Have faith in your God. We're not talking about a God sitting on the sidelines this morning waiting to see what we're going to do yet. Next. We serve a God this morning that is orchestrating every single piece of our life and He's taking us somewhere. He's heading us in a direction and we're going to wind up there. That makes me want to praise Him. I don't know about y'all, but that makes me just... makes me just like Brother Whalen. By the way, check out Brother Whalen. I keep forgetting. Uh, Brother Whalen's Simple Truth. He had one on there the other day talking about enjoying the freedom that God has given you to relax in it. And that's what I'm doing. 
But just like these brethren, sometimes people are given freedom, but they don't know how to use the freedom because they've been told all this time, you've got to do something. I'm learning to bask in my Savior's freedom, in the liberty in which He's given us. He's taken us to Joseph. He's taken us to Jesus. That's where, that's where we're getting closer to Him each and every passing day. Every situation that we're faced with, we're being taken to Joseph. And that brings peace to my heart. Father, thank You, Lord, for Your providential hand. Thank You, Lord, for a peace and an understanding even in the times of trouble, even in the times of, 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 of confusion. We're thankful that You are not the God of confusion. Lord, we get confused, but it's because of a lack of understanding on our part. You are the sovereign Creator. You are the sovereign God, Creator of heaven and earth. And I'm thankful that Your divine plan is being taken place throughout history, throughout time. As the days pass by, Lord, Your plan is just unfolding right before our very eyes. And I pray that You will get us on Your plan that You're not a remote control God, that we are to get on board with Your will. And I pray, God, that You'll give us wisdom, give us knowledge. For within our own selves, Lord, we can't seek You, we can't know the things of God outside the Spirit of God. And Lord, let us have peace in these troubled times when, when things doesn't seem like they're going right. Let us be reminded of the God we serve today and that it is you that is taking us there and not we ourselves. And Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day in the Lord, guys. And uh, enjoy this Sunday evening and shake hands with one another on your way out. We love you. Chipmunks, ready to sing your song? I'll say we are.